I, I was born in a poor section of Miami, Florida called Liberty City. I was born in an abandoned building on a floor with a twin brother. And when we were six weeks of age, we were adopted. And when I was in the fifth grade, I was identified as EMR, labeled educable, mentally retarded, put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade. And I failed again when I was in the eighth grade. I don't have any college education, but because of my mother, and I feel like Abraham Lincoln, who said, all that I am and all that I ever hope to be, I owe to my mother. I saw a sign once that said that God took me from my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. So my first major goal was to buy my mother a home, to take care of my mother. And, and I did that, took care of her until she passed at 88. But I'll never forget when I met Mr. Washington, I was in a class waiting on another student, and, and he came in and he said, young man, go to the board and work this problem out for us. I said, oh, sir, I, I can't do that. He said, why? I said, I'm not one of you students. He said, look at me. I said, yes, sir, go to the board and work the problem out anyhow. I said, sir, I, I can't do what you're asking me to do. He said, why? Sir, because I'm, I'm educable, mentally retarded, sir. And as the students erupted in laughter, he came from behind his desk, he looked at me and he said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And that was a turning point in my life. On one hand, I was humiliated. But on the other hand, I was liberated. Because he looked at me with the eyes of Goethe who said, look at a man the way that he is. He only becomes worse. But look at him as if he were what he could be. Then he becomes what he should be. I've found that most people fail in life, not because they aim too high and miss. Most people fail in life because they aim too low and hit, and many don't aim at all. So raise the bar on yourself, and don't ask how you're, doing, how you're going to do it. I'll never forget when I decided that I wanted to become a motivational speaker. I saw the, the late Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, and, and my heart said, I can do that. But my mind asked the question, how? And for over 14 years, for 14 years, I would go see Zig Ziglar and Dr. Norman Vincent Peale and Jim Rohn and different speakers, and I would be in the audience, and, and my heart would pounce and say, you can do that, you can do that, Les. And then when I would leave, I would be going to the parking lot, and my mind said, how are you going to do it? And I spent so many years trying to figure out how. I wasted 14 years. How many of you ever procrastinated? Raise your hands, please. Yeah, see, so, so as you begin to think about your goals, the most important thing is, and write this down, commit yourself. See, once you commit yourself, the how will come. The way will come. Once you commit yourself, you will then figure it out. And if you're going in the wrong direction, all you have to do is turn around and go in the other direction. You will figure it out. You want to begin to just challenge yourself. You want to stretch yourself because you really don't know what you can't do. I want you to think about the goals that you want to achieve, and I really want to challenge you to make up your mind that you're going to make that happen for yourself. And I hope that it's some goal that, that really resonates with who you are. When I was a little boy, my goal was to, to just buy groceries for our family. My mother worked on Miami Beach. She was a domestic worker. And, and my goal was to, to really be able to go to the grocery store and purchase groceries ourselves. The families knew that my mother had adopted seven children. And so they said, Mamie, whatever food is left over after we eat, you can take that home to the children. They were very kind, very, very considerate people. The mother, my mother, who, when she worked on Miami Beach, the people were very kind. I was appreciative of their generosity. But as a little boy, I said, Mama, one day, when I become a big boy, I'm going to be able to buy groceries for us. My goal as a little boy was to buy clothes for my brothers and sisters. We wore the hand-me-down clothes of the children that Mama babysat for when she went over in Miami Beach. And if the clothes were too small, she would let them out. And if they were too large, Mama could sew and take them up. And I'll never forget um, David Sadursky. His father was very wealthy. Mama worked for him. But David was my buddy. And so... His father gave him two gifts for his birthday. Gave him uh, a, a brand new boat, but he also gave him some motivational tapes. Earl Nightingale, I'm, I'll never forget. So he said, David, man, let me tell you something. When, when I die, you, you're going to get everything. I want you to listen to these tapes. And, and when his father left the room, David threw those tapes in the wastebasket. I said, David, could I have those tapes? He said, yes. I said, man, your father said, if you listen to these, 
you, you can get more and do more than what he's done. He said, look, I'm going to get everything anyhow. Go ahead, take them. <laughs> Write this down. It's not what you leave for your children. It's what you leave in them. You have something special. You have greatness within you. And the only reason you are here, you are my assignment. You can feel me. Some of you feel me right here in your heart of hearts. And my goal in, is to get past your mind and into your heart. So it's necessary that you, you have the mindset that I can do this. You've got to begin to believe and to fortify that belief and feed that belief by listening to tapes, going to seminars and workshops, by challenging yourself, by stretching yourself. It was Osborne who said, unless you attempt to do something beyond that, which you've already mastered, you will never grow. And, and as you begin to challenge yourself, you'll discover some things about yourself that you don't know right now. The other thing is you begin to look at yourself, look at your dreams, and, and, and begin, begin to experiment and stepping into your greatness. One of the things that's very important, whatever goals and dreams that you have, make your move before you're ready. Price Pritchett, who's a great, great motivator and, and, and trainer, said, make your move before you're ready. We're in, instructed in, in life to walk by faith and not by sight. See, you want to really begin to stretch yourself. You want to become a risk taker. You want to raise the bar on yourself. Most people won't do that. See, most people engage in low life living, low risk living. This God said, if you're not willing to risk, you cannot grow. And if you cannot grow, you cannot become your best. And if you cannot become your best, you can't be happy. And if you can't be happy, then what else is there? I like what Helen Keller said, life is short and unpredictable. Eat the dessert first. And so you want to begin to take some chances. You want to begin to challenge yourself and make it okay to fail and learn from your failures. Don't allow fear of failure and the, the, the allure, the attractiveness of playing it safe in life to draw you in. You can't get out of life alive. You've got to die to leave here. Other thing is you look at yourself and look at your dreams, detoxify your life, write that down. See, I think that most people never achieve their true goals in life because they're surrounded with too many toxic, negative, energy draining people. You've got to look at the people in your life and ask yourself the question, what is this relationship doing to me? How is it impacting my life? Am I a better person? Sidney Poitier wrote a book called The Measure of a Man. In there he said, when you go for a walk with someone, something happens unconsciously. It's not spoken. Either you adjust to their pace or they adjust to your pace. Whose pace have you adjusted to? See, you want to surround yourself. My, my daughter, Ona Brown, who's a speaker and coach, she says, call forth your team, but make sure these are people that you can learn from. It's, it's possible you can live your dream. It's necessary that you have the mindset that, that I'm going to do this. But you've got to take ownership. You've got to decide, hey, I'm going to do this. You're going to, you've got to take responsibility for your life. George Bernard Shaw said, the people that make it in this life, they look around for the circumstances that they want, and if they can't find them, they create them. You've got to decide, it's me. You've got to say, and say this with, with conviction, I expect to win. I think it's important that we say that. You know, if you ask most people, do you want to become successful? They will say yes took my oldest son for a walk, my namesake. You know, we always expect our children to do far more than what we do. I said, Calvin, he wants his own identity. He's Leslie Calvin Brown, Jr. I stopped him, looked him in the eyes. I said, do you want to be successful, son? He said, yes, sir, Dad. Very good. Let's walk, son. Walk further. Stopped him again. I said, Calvin, Look me in the eye, son. Yes, sir, Dad. Do you expect to be successful, son? And he stood there and he looked at me and his eyes got glassy. And he said, let's walk. And the reason that he said, let's walk, because my son is very bright. Of all my children, he's perhaps the smartest one. But Calvin now, over 30, Calvin now, a single parent of two daughters, good father. Calvin, now at this stage of his life, he's behind on his dreams, a lot of talent, a lot of abilities, very conservative, one of those people, great mind, but 
just, he just hasn't developed that, oh, uh, you know, things that we want our kids to have that, I want it. Calvin, Calvin, you got to kick it up a notch, son. You never thought you'd be in your 30s. You got to kick it up a notch. You got to increase your energy in order to, to live your dreams. You can't be casual about your dreams. Bill Bailey said, if you're casual about your dream, you'll end up a casualty. Shake someone's hand on your right and left and say, kick it up a notch. Yes. Yes. You got to kick it up a notch. What is it you bring? And whatever you bring, you've got to kick it up a notch. What is your signature? As you look at where you want to go and what it is you want to do, as you look at your product or your services, repeat out to me, please, provide more service than you get paid for. Yeah, see, that becomes your signature. When you look at your goals and look at where you want to go, at your products, at your services, at your industry, you want to set some high standards for yourself. I like what Henry David Thoreau said, do not go where the path may lead, but go where there's no path and leave a trail. How is it that your industry will be done differently five years from now, ten years from now? What is your reputation in your industry? When you come into a room and you leave, what's the scuttlebutt about you? Do people say, hey, that's a go-to person. That's a person, if you ask them to do that job, you're talking about the job being done. It will be done extremely well. Are you known for that person that, to believe that I could do this? It was hard. Never forget, my son said, Daddy, are you going to die? Why are you asking me that? You're not going out much. You're not the bubbly personality that I know you to be. You're not talking much. You're spending a lot of time in the room by yourself, Dad. Are you going to surrender? Are you giving up? Are you going to let that, that doctor's opinion become your reality? Will my daddy see me graduate? Yes, yes, son, yes, yes. I'm going to fight. No, no, I, I don't think it's my time yet. I'm going to see you graduate, but more than that, I've got some other things that I'm going to do with my life. And I thank you for asking me that. Um, but I must tell you that I'm scared. I'm scared. And um, I've never been in this situation before. It's, it's been easy for me to talk to people and encourage people when they've had challenges in their lives. Um, but it's me. And I don't feel less than a man in, 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 in admitting this to you. Yes, I'm scared. And I need some help. Repeat after me, please. Ask for help. Not because you're weak, but because you want to remain strong and ask for help, and don't stop until you get it. Yes, yeah, see, see, life is hard, and, and there are some moments in life when you're going to need some help. You're going to need somebody to speak to you. You're going to need somebody to say something to you. I have a friend of mine, Willie Jolly, who's a motivational speaker. He said, a setback is a setup for a comeback. I had to listen to Willie's tapes. I have another friend, Kevin Brace, who's a, who's a speaker. He said, Les, come on, man. You can do this. You can make this happen. You can hit a home run. It's a done deal. You are Les Brown. That cancer's got to get out of your body. I said, talk to me, Kevin. Talk to me. That's what I need to hear. I needed to hear those words. I don't care who you are. Many people won't allow themselves to ask for help because of, of pride. Pride cometh before fall. Because of ego. Ego means edging God out. No, ask for help. Not because you're weak, but because you want to remain strong. And ask for help and don't stop until you get it. I'm here because a lot of people helped me. I'm here because a lot of people believed in me at a time when I was struggling to believe in myself. The other thing is, let us say together, it's worth it. Yeah, see, I think, and write this down, you've got to find five reasons that will make it worth it for you. Five reasons. What will make it worth it for you? Mine was, I want to take care of my mother. Mine was, I want to do something with my life. What will make it worth it for you? Mine is, I want to leave a legacy. Mine is, I refuse to die an unlived life. What will make it worth it for you? Repeat out to me, please. You've got to be hungry. No one could have convinced me that... I would be doing what I'm doing right now. You know, the easiest thing I do every year is, is go into a sales organization and dramatically increase their sales or go into a prison and, and enable prisoners to see themselves differently and teach them the methods and techniques of how to plug into the system or motivate young people to begin to, to see how they can have a vision of themselves in the future and fit. That's the easiest thing I do to, or train a speaker to help them to leverage their experience as a speaker and say, look, speaking is a projection of who you are, not who you think you ought to be. 
and come with power from a platform. That's the easiest thing I've ever done. Let me share with you the most difficult thing I've ever done. The most difficult thing I've ever done was to believe that I can do what I'm now doing. No one could have convinced me, just given my circumstances. I earn millions of dollars every year. No one could have convinced me. If, if both my parents came up here right now, I, I would not know either one. No one could have convinced me, being labeled educable, mentally retarded, born in an abandoned building on the floor in Liberty City, poor section of Miami, Florida, failing twice in school, no college training, never worked for a major corporation. I did not know. I can do what I'm doing right now. I'll never forget Mike Williams, my mentor. One, I think a lot of people fail in life because of the fact that they need some mentoring. They need some coaching. When you begin to understand and acknowledge your fear and you go forth anyhow, you go forth in a spirit and a knowing that there's a way that you can begin to handle this. There's a way out here somewhere. There's a solution what it is that you're seeking, that you have the capacity to whatever comes up, to handle it, to face it. And rather than feeling powerless, you begin to feel powerful. See, when all of the major downsizings that are taking place around this country, there are a lot of people who are biting their fingers in fear that they might lose their jobs. But there are few people who have decided within themselves, I'm going to make it. Some people aren't waiting to be cut. Some people are moving on their own because they feel within themselves, I've got what it takes to make it. They're not afraid about tomorrow because of how they see themselves, because of what they feel that they deserve because of what they feel that they can create for themselves. Because these people have decided, as they look at the future, as they look at themselves, there's a way. Where there's a will, there's a way for me to begin to create a way out of no way. And when you have that kind of consciousness, when you have that kind of spirit, nothing can stop you. Nothing. What would your life be like as you look toward the future, if you decide it, I'm not going to allow my fears to stop me. What would your life be like? What would your future be like if you decided to, to want that which you desire so strongly that it prepares you past your fears, that you experience the fear, as the one book says, feel the fear and do it anyway. What would your life be like? And I'm saying to you that all of us who have been entombed by fear have the capacity to resurrect ourselves. Is it easy? No. It's not easy. Can I do it? Yes. What's one of the ways to get started? Some of us need somebody to hold our hands. Sometimes we need somebody to help us out. Be willing to say, I don't know. Be willing to reach out. Be willing to get some assistance to take you to the next level. What great athlete. You never expect boxers to make profound statements. I think it was Joe Frazier who said this one. He says, all of us are like the blind man at some point in our lives standing on the corner waiting for somebody to lead us across. So all of us at some point in our lives need some help, need someone to reach out to us, to throw out the lifeline, to help us go across some treacherous waters that we couldn't navigate by ourselves. None of us do it by ourselves. All of us at some point in our lives. We need that kind of help. We need that kind of assistance because we grow from the people we have in our lives that can enrich our lives personally, professionally, spiritually, and all the dimensions of our lives. We don't grow in a vacuum. So as you look at yourself, what are the fears you have that maybe you need some help in strengthening yourself in that area as you assess your strengths and your weaknesses, as you begin to approve yourself and your passions and your dreams and your goals and the things that you want. If you decide to experience all of your true potential, as you decide to manifest all of your greatness, as you decide, wait a minute, what, what else is available to me out here if I decided to experience the fear of rejection the fear of no, the fear of failure, 
the fear of, of standing by myself, what else is available? Of taking a chance, a fear of losing it all, what else is available to me that will bring some extra meaning and value? The fear of people not liking me. You know how many people do things they don't want to do because they want everybody to like them? Everybody's not going to like you. Excuse me, special announcement. Everybody's not going to like you. No, that's, it's, it's just not that kind of world. What? But you know, there are a lot of people who won't take positions on issues who won't take a stand for things they believe in, who won't speak up for themselves because they don't want to make anybody mad. Oh, it was Bill Cosby. He said, I don't know what the secret of success is. He said, but here's what I know what the secret of failure is. He said, trying to please him.